Hello and welcome to the PVA Nightly Rundown, episode 63 for October 28th, 2019. I am your host, Luke Croft, and this is the Nightly Gaming News Show, where I run you through all of the gaming news that you may have missed throughout the day so that you don't look like a fucking idiot at the water cooler tomorrow. Hopefully everybody had a marvelous weekend. Um, I am still exhausted from a uh, uh, an extended period of manual labor that I had to participate in on Saturday. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, uh, I am not one who works with my hands. My hands are soft as a baby's bottom, uh, due to the fact that I work 40 hours, uh, typing on, uh, this, this keyboard right here, this, uh, this wireless Apple keyboard. So my hands are, are not rough with work. Uh, but my father, who I love dearly, uh, needed some help because the the floor of his shed collapsed due to some flooding. And so he wanted to convert this area underneath his deck into a shed. And so he called me and my two brother-in-laws over uh, to help him with it on Saturday. I got there at 730. We worked for 12 straight hours on this thing, closing it in. I wish I had the picture loaded up because I'm actually uh, pretty proud of what we did because it looked really cool, looked really good. You know, we framed out some walls. We roofed the place, um, you know, and this whole thing was I want to be able to park my uh, my lawnmower under here and it not get wet. And so we're like, yeah, we can help you with that. So we worked for, no joke, 12 hours on this thing uh, with him, left around 730. Uh, that night we got a straight up fucking downpour of rain all the way through to the next morning. So I texted him and I said, Hey dad, how'd the, how'd the new shed hold up? And he said, it leaked like a sieve. <laughs> He's like every seam everywhere. We put caulk. It just, it leaked everywhere. And so 12 hours of work, not completely down the drain. Cause the walls are still up and stuff, but the roof, which was like, we used this, the, this like st corrugated steel stuff. Um, you know, looked real nice. He was like, there was water all in it. <laughs> He's like, oh, we'll get it figured out. So I'm likely going to have to go back over at some point and help him out. But, uh, I don't know. I, I don't like, I wouldn't want to do that kind of work every single day, but I like getting in there from time to time, you know, and getting my hands dirty and just, remembering i can do these things like i can i can use power tools i, I you know i can drive nails I, I i don't have a lot of great ability in there my brother-in-law was really the mastermind behind a lot of like the putting up of the walls but uh but yeah if i'm being told what to do i can do it yo bill for real what is up feel good finishing a project like that too it, and that's true like um and it would feel better if it hadn't leaked but you know at least for the 12 hours between when i left his house and when i texted him about the rain uh, i felt really good about what we had done you know and so we uh i don't know it was good work it was it was good to spend time with my dad you know uh i'm kind of in this mode like it, my wife and i were looking to move hopefully soon you know, uh, and it could be a little move. It could be a big move. And I think we're kind of in this phase right now where we're kind of just soaking up family time. Like, uh, so it was nice to just spend 12 hours with my dad cutting up, uh, with him. Like I'm a big jokester and there are days where that really gets on his nerves. And then there are days where I think it really helps. And I think Saturday was the day where it really helped. Cause we were all just like this, this kind of fucking sucks. But I also realized like, I'm just old and out of shape and I'm working on it. I've lost, I've lost like close to 15 pounds at this point, which is awesome. Um, and I'm feeling pretty good, but I woke up Saturday. I mean, I'm sorry. I woke up Sunday and the, the back of my thighs just like fucking killing me. Thank you, Bill, for real. Uh, I'm pretty proud of it. I, I lose weight like quick. And I, I, I say this all the time on, on the rundown, but I lost 80 pounds right after college, ended up gaining a lot of that back, you know, after get, getting married. And so I'm trying to get back down to my smallest. I say, as I drink a, uh, you know, 9 PM beer, but I've really, I really haven't eaten a ton today. Um, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that was my Saturday I woke up Sunday and I was like, I just, I'm not going to do anything. So I watched all the world's matches that I missed. And then the world's matches that, uh, you know, took place on Sunday and, uh, then just watched football for the rest of the day. till my wife got home and then we ended up watching, uh, what did she, it was, uh, the crimes of Grindelwald, the, uh, fantastic beast. So she turned that on and I ended up falling asleep like halfway through it at like eight 30 at night. So the movie was over and she's like, do you want to go to bed? And I was like, what time is it? She's like, it's nine 15. 
I was like, yeah, that's fine. So I went to bed at 9.15 last night. And this morning, hold on, let me take a sip of this. So this morning, you know, wake up 6.30, get ready for work. Mondays, I like to go over to the coffee shop. Uh, you know, just chill. I've got some meetings. I can sit on my meetings while I'm in the coffee shop drinking some delicious, delicious coffee. And I, as I'm leaving, as I'm leaving the house, closing the door, I go, I pull it shut, click, click, you know, latch engages. I feel my pocket keys are inside the house. I was like, okay, well, no problem. This is why we, you know, leave the garage door unlocked because I can punch the code in, go in through the garage. It's fine. I put the code in like 20 fucking times into our garage door. It does not open. So I don't know if like it's on the fritz, if like the power went out, if like there's a battery involved in it somehow that's gone dead. But I just, uh, I'm like, fuck. So I'm locked out of the house. I've got my backpack and I'm like, all right, well, the the coffee shop's like two miles away. I'll just, you know, huff it to the, uh, to the coffee shop. So I start walking. I call my wife. My wife's like, I've got a few minutes before the kids get here. You know, I can make sure somebody's watching my classroom come back because she lives like a half a mile from the from our house. Uh, she works like a half a mile from where we live. She's like, I'll just come back to the house, let you in. I was like, don't worry about it. I'm fine. I'll just walk. Uh, I'll just walk to the coffee shop. I'll work there for the rest of the day. You can just come pick me up after work. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. So I, I get about halfway there and we live in the hilliest fucking neighborhood of all time. And I've got my thighs still killing me from this manual labor I participated in on Saturday. And I get about halfway there. I'm like, fuck, I'm about to die. So I call my sister up. I'm like, Hey, explain the whole thing to her. She's dropping her kids off at school. I was like, I'll just wait here. She lives real close to my house. I was like, if you can just pick me up and drop me off at the coffee shop, that'd be great. So uh, she picks me up, drops me off, making fun of me, you know, for uh, trying to huff it, knowing that there's just hills, all kinds of hills between me and the, if it had been flat, I'd have been fine. But it was like, I'm not kidding. There are hills in my neighborhood that I've got to look up to like this to see the top of. And I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it, calling in the uh, reinforcements here. So she takes me, I get out and they've been talking for like two, two or three weeks at my coffee shop. You know, we're doing some remodeling. We're going to change the menu, blah, blah, blah. I go in, they painted. It looks awesome. And uh, I, I order the same thing every time I go. It, it's a uh, it's like this uh, this breakfast wrap and a, and a coffee, just a black coffee, large black coffee. And the guy's like, uh, all right, your total is $9.80. And I'm like, what the fuck? A coffee in this breakfast wrap, a black coffee in a breakfast wrap, nine eighty. And he's like, yeah, man, we're, we're, we're on our new menu now. It involves the price, price increases. I'm like, this is close to $4 more expensive than what I had been paying every single week for this thing. And I felt like a real old man, but I was like, is there something like fundamentally different about what I am getting that it's almost double the original price that I had been paying? He's like, well, no, we just, you know, in order to stay in business, we had to increase some prices. And I'm not kidding. I, I, and this is probably very boomer of me, uh, old man vibes, but reasonable. Bill for real can, uh, can, can give me the boomer status if, if I need it for, for real, I will probably not go back to that coffee shop fucking nine dollars and 80 cent for a coffee and a breakfast wrap i looked at the menu a large black coffee now is like four bucks four bucks for a large black coffee i'm like i can fucking go to chick-fil-a sit and use their wi-fi unabated all day sit there and pay a dollar fifty for a large cup of coffee dollar 99 for a large cup of coffee like i am i, I i'm just over it i'm not gonna do that shit you know the coffee is good it is not that good I can make it better at home, which I which I've been doing a lot more lately to save some cash. But yeah, Monday's probably no longer going to the coffee shop. Just gonna hit up Chick Fil A. But so yeah, yeah, that's way too much for coffee. And like I'm a coffee guy, right? I love coffee. And they sell like the pound bags or the yeah, like the, you know you can buy a, buy a, a pound of coffee. Um, and the the coffee they brew. You can buy a pound of it for like 16 bucks. I'm like, so the for the price of four cups of your coffee, which I can only get refilled once. You only get one refill. No free, ref, free refills past one. 
uh, for the price of four of those cups, I can just buy a fucking bag of coffee and be good for two weeks at my own house. Which is probably what I just need to start doing. Gonna miss the famous coffee shops stores. I don't know what that's in reference to, Bill, for real. Not sure. Oh, gonna miss the famous coffee shop stories. Yeah, I've got a lot of great memories of that coffee shop. A lot of really crazy shit that's happened to me at that coffee shop. I go like, you know, I used to go like every day, um, you know, and at least get a coffee because I like sitting out on their little porch. There was this dude that came in today who farted like audibly at the table right in front of me. No joke, like four times. Like he he brought the, he he always brings in this like tote bag with his art supplies and he sits there and he like draws and shit, and the and and today he like drew and shit while he was sitting there. Ridiculous. But anyway, hopefully you guys had a great weekend. Bill, for real, did you get up to anything awesome this weekend? I've been loving just chilling and watching Worlds. I love that Worlds is in Europe this year, and so it's like on as soon as I wake up. And I've actually been going back and watching 2018 Worlds as well. Because I'm just that addicted to esports, which is uh, the common connection Bill for real and I have, host Project Esports, which is live later tonight. Dude, you saw Joker? I saw Joker on Friday. I went to the movie theater by myself on Friday. My wife was out of town. I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to, I'm going to see Joker. And then he went to a concert. Nice. Who'd you see? It was dark. It was real dark. I I, I talked about it a little bit on Friday, but I was like. I love Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix, one of my favorite actors of all time. Um, his performance was stellar. But the whole time I'm sitting there watching it, I was like, why? Like, there's nothing redeeming about this. And I don't think the the, the writer is trying to get me to to empathize with Arthur as a character. I don't, nobody in, the, in Gotham is relatable. You know, they're all either rioters or, like, uber rich. Um the the mother was an evil person uh you know the the social worker was aloof and uh unattentive like there was nobody i could really latch onto as a character that i could identify with in it and so the whole time i'm sitting there and i'm thinking like why the fuck does this movie exist not that it wasn't good it was definitely good but as far as a purpose goes i just uh, i was like why why did i need this in my life it, it, it does a good job of not glorifying the Joker, not like making him look heroic, I don't think. I think he looks flawed enough that it's really hard to see him and want to be like him, I guess in a twisted way, a lot uh, some people will. But but yeah, I just uh, I left the movie feeling a little dirty and a little little confused. So phone's over here blowing up. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I'll probably end up watching it again because it's one of those movies that's kind of stuck with me. I've thought about it quite a bit since I left the theater, and I like that about it. And I really just want to talk to people about it, too. Um, I don't know. Maybe Cody and I will do, like, a special one-off podcast to PBA Radio or something like that. Maybe get some other people. Maybe maybe get you in there, Bill, for real, who's seen Joker, and talk about it as well. Because, I don't know. It was strange. Left me feeling weird. Left me feeling weird. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, this is P- the, the PVA Nightly Rundown, though. Uh, we do this every weeknight over here at 9 p.m. Eastern time over here on twitch.tv slash PVA radio. This week, we're going to get back to uploading it over on YouTube the very next day as well on youtube.com slash PVA radio. I've been slacking. Um, I think Zach Zweizen may be out on vacation this week, so I could not find the games releasing today. There was no uh, This Week in Games article posted on Kotaku, so you're on your own until that gets posted to find what is releasing today a little bit of housekeeping new episode of pva radio is up uh that was published on uh friday i was a little behind work's been kind of crazy for me lately um so uh we had some good conversations about bots and Fortnite. we talked about fallout first and then some of our weird gaming habits definitely go check that out on youtube.com slash pva radio or on podcast services everywhere and if you want to watch that show live we do that on twitch.tv slash pva radio at 9 30 p.m eastern time on wednesdays um but let's jump into the news because we have quite a few items on the list um here uh first item on the list this is from vg247 King Thalion is leaving Twitch for Mixer. Um, this is from Sharif Syed. It says King Thalion, the 
and I may be saying that incorrectly, uh, but the well-known Destiny streamer is ditching Twi Twitch for Mixer. Uh, Corey King Gothali on Michael has become the third high-profile streamer to leave Twitch for Microsoft's Mixer, following uh, in Shroud and Ninja's footsteps. Though Gothalion is not nearly as big of a name compared to the other two uh, superstars, he's consistently among the most popular Destiny streamers. When he's not playing Bungie's loot shooter, Gothalion also streams other games such as Borderlands. Uh, the streamer broke the news on Twitter, confirming that his first stream on Mixer will take place tomorrow, October 28th at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, in the announcement video, he said Mixer will allow him to mentor more up-and-coming streamers and raise more money for charity through events he organizes. So, uh, I'm not sure how long this video is. Hey guys, it's announcement time. Let's jump May right not into watch it. Much of a lot this. of you have been expecting this, guessing it on Twitter. Um, but as of the 29th, I've never watched this guy. will be streaming exclusively on Mixer. I uh, sat down thinking this was going to be a tough decision, but honestly, it felt kind of easy peasy. Um, <laughs> it's my belief that, you know, which means there's probably a Xbox lot of money, upfront Microsoft money involved in the move. Not only going to help us propel uh, what we're doing, but also propel what's always been kind of important to the channel, which is doing good in gaming. Uh, everything from, you know, helping broadcasters establish themselves. Yeah, straight um, up dollars, deal for real. Uh, growing broadcasters, raising money for charity. Um, and putting on events like Guardian Con and GCX. Cool. All right, you guys can go watch that that, that whole video um, over on uh, uh, at Gothalion on 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 Twitter. Uh, we talked about the Shroud news last week, and obviously we've talked at length about Ninja as well. Uh, I think that, and I'm going to kind of reiterate some points I made around the Shroud thing. Obviously, Gothalion is uh, or. Gotha Leon uh, is is not nearly as big a streamer as a Shroud or a Ninja, but I think the move is representative is still indicative of some truths about uh, what Ninja has been experiencing on Mixer, and I think that is that Microsoft can go to these streamers, that Mixer can go to these streamers and say, "Hey, we can't guarantee you the same exact viewership numbers or the same exact uh, you know." Um, engagement on your videos or on your streams but what we can guarantee you is number one we're going to be able to supplement any kind of lost revenue uh with whatever dollar amount package that we're going to uh sign you to for your exclusivity but also we can promise you a consistent audience here on mixer you know x percent of your audience is going to follow you over on the first day and x x percent is going to continue to follow you i think that all of these well these two signings between uh, shroud and now uh, king gothalion I, I think is evidence that ninja did not experience as much of a fall off in consistent engagement from his audience as maybe a lot of us were expecting because i know when that news first came out about ninja my thought was okay, he's going to have a bunch of his audience that like comes over day one, day two, and then they're going to ultimately fall off to the wayside. But I think that it's, pro it's, it's evident that that fallout hasn't been quite as stark. Not, not quite, as, quite as evident. And so I think Ninja has been successful. I think, at least anecdotally, I've seen a lot of people who have jumped over and said, hey, I really like Twitch as a platform. I like the user interface. I like the other interactivity that you can have with streamers on the platform as well. Uh, they're constantly, I think, uh, I think the rate at which they release new features on Mixer is far, far faster than twitch and that's that's a result of competition and having to play catch up that uh mixer is constantly looking at their platform saying how can we improve and, and so i think all those things kind of combined makes it so that it's it like he said it, it's really not much of a consideration uh they're supplementing my law lo my lost revenue here there's an audience engagement people enjoy the platform uh and at the end of the day you're pressing go live and you're doing the same exact thing you were doing on twitch but maybe on a platform you just believe in more. And so, so yeah, I think Mixer is making all the right moves to continue to stay relevant. And I think that this is the important phase of it. You've gotten your big names. You've gotten your ninjas. You've gotten your shrouds. Who are these other big names in kind of smaller, more niche communities? Not that Destiny is like smaller niche, but it's smaller and more niche than, uh, you know, Fortnite or Apex Legends or, you know, the big battle royales. Um and so they're going to have to look to these to these guys and say, how can how can we stack our bench down the line, getting getting people from uh, from from the Destiny community com community, getting people from the Borderlands community, getting people from like 
if we went to Twitch right now, let's do this. If we went to Twitch and we just went to the browse category, you know, you want to start looking like who are the big Call of Duty streamers that they can go after? Who are the big Rainbow Six uh, streamers they can go after? Big. Uh, we haven't really seen a shoe drop on the Overwatch streaming side of things. I don't know how relevant or important that's going to be. Uh, League of Legends is another big one that I think they, they need to try to find uh, a foothold in because League is so big. Um, you know, Rocket League. And I still fall back on the thing. I think the next step is getting some exclusive uh streaming rights to or at least some streaming rights in general to esports um i don't think you're going to be able to get an overwatch league or a league of legends or or a dota or anything like that but can you come in to those kind of second tier esports like your nba 2k league your rainbow six siege uh pro league and and start to scoop up if not the leagues maybe some uh some mid-season tournaments so that you can start uh, so that they can start to get a little bit of a uh, a foothold in in that arena as well so i think that's kind of the next step and this is them progressing and i think that becomes easier when you have your ninjas and your shrouds and you say look here's kind of our like tentpole personalities but not only do we have these tentpole personalities that we're paying good money for for their exclusive content but also look at the engagement on these individuals as well and um you know, not to not to steal some Reaganomics here, but you know, just the trickle down of it is, hey, if I'm watching Ninja stream and at the end of his stream he, you know, hosts or raids another channel, or you know, he just stops going live and I can go, but I'm already on Mixer and I can go look at other channels. The rising tide lifts all boats, kind of thing. So, uh, if we can bring in thousands of people to watch Ninja. The goal is that a portion of those thousands are going to leak out and find other streamers on on Mixer to watch. It's a great strategy. I think it's a very intelligent strategy for them. I think they're doing it in a slow enough manner that um, I don't think it's breaking the bank for them necessarily. Um, so, yeah, I, I appreciate the approach. Uh, say what you will about exclusive content. Say what you will about streamers making that leap for, for that paper. But uh, to me, it's just you are your brand you got to make the decisions that are best for you and if this is the best decision for shroud or ninja or king of Thalion, more power to him man so be interesting to see who the next who the next uh, i'm sure there's like, articles out there of like who's the next big streamer going i don't know enough about the like you know high view streamers uh to to make any kind of prediction there but i'm sure that this is not the last that we're going to see before the end of the year. We'll probably see another two, three, four streamers uh, sign on to Mixer that'll, you know, make a splash. Moving on. Next item on the list, Epic is suing a former tester for leaking details of Fortnite Chapter 2. This is from Luke Plunkett over at Kotaku. It says Epic Games is in the process of suing a former uh, tester for spoiling some of Fortnite's big Chapter 2 reveal secrets. As Polygon reports, Epic filed the suit last week in North Carolina, alleging that former tester Ronald Sykes, who had played loads of the Chapter 2 content back in September, began tweeting at other Fortnite players ahead of Epic's Black Hole event, leaking information like the ability to swim, along with showing an image of the game's new map. The basis of Epic's suit is that Sykes signed a non-disclosure agreement when he took the job, and that revealing all this information ahead of time broke that agreement. Quote, he did so at the expense of Epic and those in the Fortnite community who were anxiously awaiting the new season of Fortnite, only to have some of Epic's planned surprises spoiled by Sykes' leaks. End quote. The suit says, and then and you can read the full statement. Um, you got to be really fucking dumb to think that you can get away with this. <laughs> you have to be really fucking dumb to think that you can get away with going into a company, signing an NDA to test a product that is not, not just not released, but not yet announced, and then go out and talk about it and not have a reckoning come your way. And so, you know, I guess people can debate about the validity of NDAs, about, uh, you know, the marketing machine that are these giant ass video game companies. But all of that is moot when you sign your name to a dotted line saying, I promise not to do this. 
And then you come out and you do it. And this is not something, you know, this isn't him signing an NDA about work conditions and coming out and saying, I'm breaking my NDA to bring bring to light the, the shitty conditions that Epic is making me work in. This isn't him breaking an NDA to talk about shitty pay to say, oh, I had to sign an agreement to not talk about what I was getting paid, but they're paying, you know, $5 an hour to these testers. It's not even minimum wage. This isn't that kind of story. This dude literally signed on to test a product before it was announced and released and then turned around and talked about said product before it was announced or released. And you have to be really fucking dumb to think that that's a good idea. And people who are coming to the defense of Ronald Sykes and just saying, yeah, fuck Epic. What what does it matter? You know, they were going to reveal it anyway. Like that is so fucking dumb. There is a level of professional decorum that you must have. And now Ronald Sykes is not going to be able to find any other work, not just in testing, but in any kind of games industry job because of this and you know a lot of people use testing as a stepping stone into some other thing uh in games and so if he had aspirations of that good luck good luck you 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 you've sunk that ship at harbor like you're 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 not even out to sea yet in it and you fucking sunk it you're only as good as your word is and if you've signed on saying you're going to keep your mouth shut about something you should keep your mouth shut about stuff you know, I work under NDAs where I am, you know, and not that I work with any kind of product or service that you guys would care about, but, you know, I work with clients who are like, hey, you can't talk about our data. You can't talk about our plans for the future. You know, uh, you can't share these internal training videos that you're making for us. And I, you have to respect that. You have to respect it. Now, what I don't like, and, I, and you know, the, the suit, uh, document is huge and so i think kotaku is probably uh you know kind of strategically pulling a quote from here uh i don't like this whole idea of oh man he did this at the expense of the excitement of the Fortnite community the point being you signed a document and you broke your word against this legal document and we're going to make you pay for that and i don't think that you have to make it about anything larger than that you know i don't think anybody was like oh man Ronald Sykes fucking ruined Fortnite's announcement for me. And now I didn't get to experience it alongside everybody else. I say that. And as I'm saying it, I know good and well that there are people that say that. uh, Because they've said it about E3 uh, and, and stuff like that when leaks hit. But it's one thing to, like, have a reporter go in and unearth things and and report on said facts. It's a whole other thing for somebody who works there to go out with their name attached to their Twitter account and tweet at people in the community like it's just fucking dumb i will go on the record of saying i think the secrecy in the gaming industry is not not meant to serve the fan base in any way it's completely done to serve the marketing arm of these companies and uh and so like i said i don't like the defense that it ruined it for some someone in the Fortnite community who may be looking forward to this um but i do think that marketing is important for the long-term success of these companies Marketing leads directly to your sales. And so, you know, those two things being related, it's important that a company can control their own marketing, control their own announcements because they have a plan for how to maximize sales uh, that ultimately allow these games and these companies to continue to exist. But yeah, if you're signing an NDA, don't be that guy. Like if you get into an alpha for a game and it's like, hey, you're one of the testers in our alpha. We're interested in your feedback, but don't go posting videos of this on YouTube. Just don't fucking do it. Like, there's no point. What's the point? They know it's you. They know who it is. And they are well within their rights to pursue a, a, a trial like this. So, pretty dumb. Dumb all around. Play stupid games, right? Win stupid prizes. Moving on. Next item on the list. Uh, Ubisoft has revealed some high-level plans for how they are going to fix Ghost Recon Breakpoint. This is from Brandon Durer, Durer over at Dual Shockers. I apologize. I'm probably totally fucking this name up. Um, says Ubisoft is less than pleased with how game, uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint has performed since its release on October 4th. 
Co-founder and CEO Yves Gilmont shared that the game not only failed to hit sale expectations, but its reception has been largely negative. He said that Ubisoft plans to adjust its strategies going forward. One of the reasons Watch Dogs Legion, uh, Legion, Rainbow Six Quarantine, and Gods and Monsters have all been delayed to next fiscal year. Uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint isn't being looked past yet, though. Uh, and uh, I'm breaking from the article here for just a second. And this is Ubisoft's M.O., Ubisoft rarely will just abandon a product recently. Like even if they release it and it's broken and it's not really working and they stick with it to try to make it the best game that it can be. And so, uh, so this doesn't, this, none of this should come as a shock. Um, but I will also caveat the rest of this by saying, I have not yet played Ghost Recon Breakpoint because of the negative news that has come out because of it. So I can't speak directly to these specific changes, but I do want to just kind of highlight some of the high level things. Obviously, they're going to start working on some bugs and just general stability stuff um, because those issues have been uh, pretty big throughout the game. Um, there's a title update uh, 1.0.3 that hopes to clean up these issues come in November. And this is listed in the article by fixing drones, night vision goggles and the mission completion notification pop up. Uh, but then they highlight some of the post content, uh, the post launch content and back to the article. It says the first of which will be a raid releasing in December called Project Titan. A Terminator live event will follow sometime after. Next up is a fix coming to Ghost Recon Breakpoint's in-game economy. Uh, the post doesn't offer any kind of uh, any details as to what this fix will look like and when it's coming. But I imagine it might change the fact that there are two in-game currencies that can confusingly be used in tandem for the game's ridiculous amount of microtransactions. I want to stop there for just a second to talk about this. I think one of the hardest things to come back from is poor messaging and poor execution on your microtransactions. People are so sensitive to it and rightfully so. Um, they're so sensitive to the way that microtransactions are handled within games that if out of the gate you're demonstrating that the game is being solely kind of crafted around the way that people can spend real world money in that game, that's not a taste that you're going to be able to get out of people's mouths really quickly. And I don't think that that's a problem other Ubisoft games have had uh upon their release you know when you think about a game like for honor when you think about a game like uh rainbow six siege uh even when you think about games like uh well in assassin the last couple of assassin's creeds have released in really solid states but uh there's other two examples i listed the main complaint about those games was not oh the in-game economy is terrible the main complaint about those games were something about the game itself that could go back and be fixed but I think it takes a lot. It's a much harder uphill climb when you're having to fight negative, negative reception to your in-game economy and approach to microtransactions. So, out of the things that have been listed so far, I think that's one of the kind of possibly too little, too late things. Like I don't know how you rectify that because you've kind of shown your hand at the start, and people turn their nose up at it. I'm trying to think of any other game that's really had microtrans like i the most recent example of totally botched microtransactions obviously apex legends with their special uh you know with their special events but i don't feel like anybody feels any different about the way that they do my, their microtransactions i think people have just kind of moved on from the outrage over it um but with apex legends they changed the map they added a cool halloween event a lot of people have been like let's let bygones be bygones and let's go play this free-to-play game and it's fun um, going back to the article, it says there are also plans to bring AI teammates back into the fold. No timeline on when that's expected to happen. The last goalpost outlined for Ghost Recon Breakpoint is to somehow make it more tailorable. This part is especially light on details. All we know is that Ubisoft is working on a, quote, more radical and immersive version of Ghost Recon Breakpoint, end quote. Uh, and then the author notes, I personally don't know what that means, but we'll have details for you if and when they're released. Um, that's a weird kind of like nothing burger of a statement i think you know like oh we want to make it more tailorable it's going to be radical and immersive um and but i'm sure that those are things that they thought ghost recon breakpoint was when it came out um i think the most important thing for any game like this to do is listen to their community take the feedback that's being provided and implement it in ways that are advantageous to the players not like fallout 76 who took their player feedback and then decided to put it behind a paywall um so yeah i think that um i i, 
I want to wait and see with Ghost Recon. I'm interested in how how they approach how they approach fixing this because of the starting point they're coming from being pretty surrounded by controversy around their microtransactions. And I know there are other things within the game that um, I know that there are other things in the game that have, have caused the community to complain. But the microtransaction thing is a big deal, and it's been a big deal since the game was announced. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, really light on details. It's really a 30,000-foot view of what they're hoping to do. Um, but an odd statement um, probably to hear three years ago, but I'm going to say it here. I trust Ubisoft to to do their best to make things right, to stick with their game and to see it through because they've done it so much this generation you know moving on next item on the list microsoft is bringing back xbox all access and has a program where you can upgrade to the project scarlet xbox um, if you subscribe by the end of the year so this is from tom warren over at the verge it says microsoft is bringing back its xbox all access bundle back uh, I'm sorry. Microsoft is bringing its Xbox All Access bundle back. <laughs> Say that three times fast. Um, just in time for the holiday season. Xbox All Access is a bundle that splits the cost of an Xbox console, Xbox Game Pass, and Xbox Live into monthly payments across 24 months. Microsoft will bundle an Xbox One X, Xbox One S, or a digital edition of the Xbox One S with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate from $19.99 per month. Uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate provides access to games across Xbox PC and Xbox Live Gold multiplayer support. Um, the $19.99 monthly base bundle will will include a digital Xbox One S with 24 months of uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and the option to upgrade early after 18 months. A, a regular Xbox One S bundle will be priced at $22.99 per month over 24 months, and an Xbox One X will be available for $30.99 per month. Microsoft is introducing a special upgrade offer for the Xbox One X bundle with the ability to upgrade to Project Scarlet in 12 months' time. So uh, if you subscribe by the end of 2019, you make 12 payments on your Xbox One X bundle, you will be able to upgrade to Project Scarlet um, from there so uh, and they detail that here uh, Microsoft's new Xbox uh, new project Scarlet console is launching in holiday 2020 and Microsoft is maintaining this upgrade offer until December 31st 2019 you'll simply trade in your Xbox One X next year with the same retailer you purchased the Xbox all access bundle from uh, if you opt for an Xbox One S digital bundle then a fee will apply for the upgrade to Xbox Scarlet but this looks like a good deal uh, otherwise so here they break down the math here and I think this is where it's important. So if you consider an Xbox One X, X currently retails for thirty nine uh, for $399 at the Microsoft Store, and Xbox Game Pass Ultimate is usually $14.99 a month, then the total cost over two years is $758.76. If you pay uh, Microsoft $30.99 per month over two years, the total cost is $743.76, so $15 less. So you save a little bit, you spread the payments, and you get access to a Project Scarlet upgrade. Um, Microsoft is clearly announcing this Xbox All Access program ahead of Black Friday sales. Um, blah, blah, blah. They give some context. Here's, here's some more math. Uh, even the Xbox One S Digital Edition bundle seems like a reasonable deal, unless there's some good savings for the console. Uh, so at $20 a month, that's $479.76 compared to $608.76 if you purchase the console on Xbox Game Pass Ultimate separately. Um, you can do this uh, at Amazon in the U.S. Uh, or Game Smith's Toys in the U.K. or Telstra uh, in Australia. All right, so this is um, this is a service that they actually announced, I think, sometime in 2018, and just kept going for a little bit, and then uh, you know brought back, uh, and then kind of let it go by the wayside, and now they're bringing it back. Uh, so, if I understand this correctly, is it the same payment of thirty dollars and ninety nine cent for the? Oh man, I'm pressing back on all kinds of things clicked out clicked out of the wrong thing here because i'm still not quite clear on how the the actual upgrade works so you trade it in 
you pay 12 months, you trade it in, and then do you just continue to pay the thirty ninety nine for another 24 months for the Xbox Scarlet? Is that how it works? Microsoft's new project Scarlet, and Microsoft is maintaining this upgrade offer until you'll simply trade in your Xbox One X next year with the same retailer you purchased the all-access bundle from. If you opt for an Xbox One S. So yeah, uh, uh, th that's what it seems like at least. I don't know. This is a, it's an interesting offer. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will want to jump on this. I'm not one of those guys who wants to worry about making payments on shit for 24 months, even if it does result in savings, which I think makes this deal even more insane. Um, but I think where Microsoft is getting their money is we're getting people to continue to pay for Xbox uh, Game Pass Ultimate who would otherwise not be paying for that service necessarily. You know, people who need to opt for a payment plan are not likely to also opt for a subscription service. And so you're getting that money in return from them because those are probably people who are like, well, I buy two games a year maybe uh, on top of my console. So that's where I'm, I'm assuming the money making is coming from. But it's really crazy when you think like, okay, you pay $14.99 already for Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. For $5 extra, you can get a whole console for 24 months, and then you own it at the end of it. So that's, I don't know. Uh, th this is a cool program. I, I think this is Microsoft getting creative with the way that they're selling consoles. I think a story we didn't report on, or we didn't talk about last week was uh, Xbox hardware sales being a little soft this year because of the uh, transition to people are anticipating the next generation. I think there's a great stopgap, though. Like, hey. We're gonna we're gonna sell consoles through this program now. Um, get people who at the end of the console generation are probably still considering like, hey, is it gonna be worth it for me to upgrade? And so uh, you hit those people by by turning it into a deal. Um, so it's smart, I think. And uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see how many of those turn into um, Xbox Scarlet upgrades at the end of it. Next item on the list. Uh, Minecraft Dungeons was originally a 3DS game. I just thought this story was pretty interesting. This is from James O'Connor. It says, A new development diary on Minecraft Dungeons has dropped an interesting tidbit on the game's development process. The upcoming Minecraft Dungeons, which is due next year, uh, and looks pretty interesting, is the second major Minecraft spinoff after Telltale Story Mode Seasons. Uh, it's coming to Xbox One, PC, PS4, and Switch, but it actually started life as a project for the 3DS. This bit of info comes from the new Minecraft Dungeons Diary Origins video embedded below, which digs into the project history a bit. According to Jens Bergenston, uh, Chief Creative Officer at Mojang, quote, it all started when we were trying to figure out a cool Minecraft-style game for 3DS, end quote. Quote, we toyed with a bunch of different ideas, but finally making a dungeon crawler was something that really struck a chord with us. So, uh, yeah, I just found this story kind of interesting. I don't have a, a lot of commentary on this except to say this is probably a lot more common than we think of games starting develop, being developed on one platform only to be migrated over to something else. Um, the thing that I am re reminded of is uh, Until Dawn, which was originally a move game, you know, PlayStation move game uh, that Supermassive was working on, and then it turned into a... Um, which I, I, I actually just realized that makes me think of Until Dawn originally being a, a move game in my uh, in the ticker down below. Um, but yeah, uh, so it's just cool to see a game that was uh, conceptualized to work on one thing. It, and I guess this is it, you would think of this as kind of like graduated to the bigger, beefier console. So uh, so, yeah. Next item on the list. Sony is issuing refunds for WWE 2K20. This is from James O'Connor at VG247. It says WWE 2K20 is having an all-time bad launch. I'm sure you guys have seen the uh, the pictures of like the character creator, a bunch of the different glitch videos. Um, 
It says, WWE 2K20 is a true mess, and while it might be pretty funny for the casual observer, wrestling fans who paid actual money for the game are understandably annoyed. A patch is apparently on the way, but considering the state of the game is in, the state the game is in right now, you'd have reason to not be optimistic that a single patch is going to fix all its problems. To that end, Sony is stepping in to issue refunds for customers who bought the broken game. As per Eurogamer, it looks like refund requests on this title are being processed quickly. It's likely that there's a high number of them coming in, and the game is legit legitimately faulty um so this is a big deal in that sony is not known for issuing refunds for games i think the i'm sure there's been examples between now and then but the last one that i can remember is when people were uh requesting refunds for no man's sky and sony was was uh was issuing refunds that were requested i'm also interested to know if this is the same situation so with no man's sky it was like We'll issue it for you, but we only issue one refund per account. So if you use it on this, you're not going to be able to ever use a refund in the future. So I'd be interested to see if like there's a cross section of people who got that on No Man's Sky who are getting it for 2K20. Um, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. What's more more interesting here is that this is now the second straight uh, annualized release from 2K that has received a ton of backlash. There was a lot of you know broken wonkiness and microtransaction shittiness about nba 2k20 that really soured the basketball audience myself included um and i'm interested to know like with these annualized releases a lot of times you're looking at like a nine month turnaround from the day that you close development on the previous year's title until the next title has to go gold you've got about nine months and it's just seeming like 2K as a company is really struggling to get these things done in a good way uh, with WWE 2K20 not, uh, not being any kind of an exception there. Um, I'd like to start seeing more of these annualized titles going to buy annual releases, giving companies more time to innovate on the features, giving them more time to polish the game before, the, before they come out. Because this isn't the first time we've seen a 2K20 you know, quote unquote situation, uh, similar situation. Um, and it's certainly not going to be the last. And it's because the development on this shit is just rushed. Uh, let's watch the, let's watch this, uh, this glitch right here. So just floating on an invisible ring out here in the, in the aisle. And, you know, these annualized titles, which are basically just minor upgrades from the previous year's version, still cost $60. I think about, like, Madden. I would rather Madden go biannual and just say, for the, your first year of owning the game, you get free, free roster updates. And then in order to get um, roster updates from September through the, the end of the next year, uh, you got to pay 30 bucks. I'd be totally fine with that. I would pay that in a heartbeat to know that the Madden team would have 10 extra months, 12 extra months to work on a, to work on their game. They go from a nine month turnaround to a 21 month turnaround for their games. I would much rather have that than have to deal with this kind of shit. Madden has the same exact stuff, glitches left and right, terrible mechanics, terrible microtransaction implementation, not much difference in gameplay and in major game modes outside of like their microtransaction centric ones. Um this is this is the rule, not the exception for annualized games. And and this may be more egregious than those other games, but this is just this is indicative of the state of annualized, especially sports releases. And uh, and I hope that not only are people asking for refunds, but I hope that people who are on the fence about this game at an overwhelming pace have, have decided, I'm not spending my, sh my money on that shit. I hope 2K is losing money on this because I want a company to learn, like, this, this is not sustainable. This approach is not sustainable, and it's got to start with one of these smaller games like a two, like WWE rather than like NBA or FIFA, which is just a money-making fucking machine. But if we can get one of these games to go biannual and figure out a way to continually engage with the audience of the previous year's game in a way that they make money, that might encourage a game like FIFA or NBA or Madden to go the biannual route, I'm all for that.
So I, I hope that this causes 2K to really look at themselves in the mirror. Uh, let's see. Next item on the list. Steam is asking some users to revisit reviews after playing a game for an extended period of time. Uh, this story was reported by Julia Lee. I can give you the, the, the highlights here. Um, some Reddit users have been reporting that they're receiving emails from Steam asking them to go back and uh, either add to or update their reviews of games that they may have rated early on in the release, but now they've added more time to. So games like Destiny 2, Hitman 2 was another game that were, was reported. Now, it doesn't seem like they're sending those emails out like, hey, you left a bad review, but you played like 90 hours. Or, hey, you left a good review and you played like 90 hours. There's no real rhyme or reason based on that. And there's also doesn't seem to be any kind of threshold for the number of hours that have to be played in order to uh, to receive one of these emails. But I like this. you know, And I think outlets are starting to do this as well. Like, hey, here's our Destiny review a year later. Or, or something like that. Um, I think it's cool that they're re-engaging users of their games and saying, uh, hey, you've put 93 hours in this thing. You're probably more equipped to speak on this game than just about anybody. Uh, can you give us your feedback on this or can you update your feedback on this? Because at this point, there's been expansions. There's uh, all kinds of new content to play in these games. So just update your thoughts for us. I was on uh, GameStop today. <laughs> this is kind of an opposite example. I'm on, I'm on GameStop's website today, looking at Nintendo Switch Lights, um, and I'm on the page for the custom, the the special edition Pokemon one. And there were all these reviews on it already, and people were giving them like two, one, two, three stars, and saying, "GameStop, why are you sending me an email to review a product that clearly is not released yet?" This game, this this system does not come out for another few weeks, and yet you're asking for my thoughts on it because I've simply pre-ordered it. Um, so that's like the inverse of this. Like, hey, we know you haven't even had time to spend with this product. Can you give us a, a rating? But uh, but yeah, I think Steam is learning the power. First of all, the power of reviews. You know, we've talked a lot about their approach with review bombing and. Uh, you know, the alerts that they put on when a game is clearly being review bombed, like Call of Duty has been uh, because of their portrayal of Russians in the game. Um, you know, Steam's done a really good job of bringing light to that. But I think they're also recognizing the power of like, hey, we want to get people's honest thoughts on this beyond just, oh, I played 10 hours of it when it first came out. Because these games are living worlds. They're constantly changing, constantly evolving. Destiny 2 is not the same game now as it was when it released two years ago. Three years ago? How long has it been since Destiny? Destiny 2 release date. 2017. So yeah, a little over two years ago. Last item on the list. I just really wanted to talk for a second about this SNL skit. Um, from and this, You can read this up on Zach, uh, from Zach Zweizen over at Kotaku. We're not going to watch this SNL clip because... Uh, NBC is very, very particular about their copyright stuff, and this video will get nuked off the internet if we if we play it. But um, I wanted to bring this up because uh, there's been some like across the spectrum reactions to it, as you would expect. But they did a, a chance the rapper played a clueless esports reporter covering the League of Legends Worlds tournament, which I've been talking about now for weeks uh, in an SNL skit. Um, where he brings back Laszlo Holmes, who last year he played this character uh, who was sent to a hockey match, who had never covered a, a, a hockey game before. And it was really funny. So he does the same thing. Uh, and he makes some jokes in it, you know, talking about, um, you know, it's like 10 nerdy guys. This must have been what the white guy, white guys and Asians were doing when uh, when black guys uh, were were making, making rap. Uh, he makes jokes about... Um, Let's see. He, he he jokes calling it League of Legos, uh, you know, talking about how they're getting paid to play a computer game, all this stuff. And people were like offended by it. <laughs> uh, and I'm not one of those in the I'm not one of those people that was like offended by it by any means. But it was just dumb humor. It was stupid boomer humor throughout of just like the the, the tropes uh, in the, the stereotypes of gamers like they're nerdy. 
they don't get much sunlight they're socially awkward um they don't have any stage presence uh how can you make so much money uh playing playing a video game and i guess there is something about it that's cool that like hey they used the, the actual league of legends world's graphics there was clearly somebody who worked on the skit that um that new league of legends uh so all that was is pretty cool and it's cool to see esports coming into the mainstream where it can be joked on like this but i just wish that people would get more creative and i guess snl is not the right place to ask that but get more creative with the way that you joke about esports like um and and let's stop falling back on just the traditional like oh man you haven't seen you haven't seen the light of day all you do is sit in your basement and play games what's your mom think of this like uh, oh you're nerdy can't can't get women anything like uh, those kinds of things like um I, I i like seeing esports in mainstream media even when it's getting joked like this esports getting jokes is is not offensive to me at all and the jokes here weren't offensive to me either but it's just like let's let's be a little smarter <laughs> let's 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 have some smarter humor within this um, and it's just going to take more and more people being aware of what these things are and having actual fans write the jokes. I mean, go on, go on Reddit's, uh, League of Legends subreddit or the Overwatch League subreddit, and you're going to be met with all kinds of different, uh, you know, people memeing on, on players and games. And there's a lot of great content that I think could appeal to the general masses there. That isn't just like, oh man, sweaty, acne ridden, uh, esports players making $7 million, but playing a video game, blah, blah, click, click, click. So probably going to, they're probably going to talk about that on project esports too. So excited to hear their conversation as well, but guys, that is going to do it for the PVA nightly rundown for October 28th, 2019. I had to click over to the, to the sheet. Uh, remember it's Monday. So we're going to, we're going to cut it here. Um, no, no game stream tonight. I did have a ton of fun streaming apex legends the other night though. But I'm going to go for the night, uh, listen to my boys over at Project Esports, watch some Monday Night Football, hit the hay, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow night with another episode of the PVA Nightly Rundown. And until then, we love you. Goodbye.